Last night, a very unusual lunar event occurred that sent both stars and planets swirling round the moon like a celestial slingshot. Many people came out of their homes to celebrate the strange occasion. They all gathered on a hill drinking wine and making song to the night's dizzying effects. I had no interest in all of that, and besides, I had my own troubles. So I smoked more from the hookah pipe than I am accustomed, and retired to my chambers to sleep through the whole miserable event. I had just drifted off in a toxic haze when I was suddenly awoken by a violent rapping on my window that threatened the glass with every smashing tap. I jumped out of bed to investigate, but it was too dark to see anything. The banging continued for another few moments, then it stopped before it resumed once more upon my door. I kept a dagger near my bed, and my first instinct was to get it and use it, but I decided to look into the matter a little more before I pulled a shiv on someone. There was a slice of light from a crescent moon illuminating the front of my house, so when I looked through the peephole I could clearly see it was al Kakul. That was the last thing I needed at this hour, and especially that night, when the swinging universe conspired to make weaker men like me sick. So instead of heeding his obnoxious banging, I decided to put in some industrial strength earplugs and go back to bed. The plugs were heavy duty. I couldn't hear a thing, and I drifted back to sleep comfortably. Sure, Al Kakul would tire and go back wherever he came from. The next morning, I woke later than usual. When I left my chambers and entered the main room, I could see the place was trash. There was fishing tackle on the floor and two half-eaten papayas on the table. Plus, all my merengue tablets were out and scattered all over the place. It was just the type of thing that impaled me. Why would someone leave all that crap strewn about when a trash can was only steps away? And when I looked towards the can, I noticed it had been pushed over. It didn't take long for me to pick up the trash or figure out what happened. And when I checked the door, I could see someone had tampered with the lock. The evidence made it fairly obvious to anyone with any experience in this area what had happened. Al Kaku had slipped his long skinny finger into the lock and spun the pin with his extra gripping grooved print that clung to the metal like a magnet. Then he opened the door. I knew it was him for sure because whenever he did this he never set the lock's inner pin back into place and as a result my door was unlocked, unarmed and naked. A target, a payday, a nightmare, a dream for a variety of various prototypes of trauma suffering weirdos who would love to exploit this breach in security with all their perverse powers and abilities, free of self-consciousness, self-inspection, or reproach of any kind. That was the sad truth. The fact was, it was an order too tall for most psychos. No. No, I couldn't afford to get emotionally involved when I dealt with this fireball, so I got that horrible prospect out of my mind right away, and hoped he was gone for good. Moments later, my dreams were dashed when Al Kaku rudely crashed the door, taking a good piece of the frame with him. Why do you torment me with harassing blows and untidiness, I asked the sloppy giant as he picked himself up off the floor. Why do you refuse to answer my call, he retorted, pointing his foot-long finger at me. This was just the type of thing I didn't want to get involved in. Kaku had a way of redefining everything to his own advantage, and no matter what you said, he was always in the right. Listen, Al, I said in a rather reserved manner, since I can clearly remember how pissed off I was looking at that busted door frame. He had also broken my lock. I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but he did. And all that garbage he left all over the place was another matter, not to mention waking me up under all that celestial chaos. I said, listen, Al, you've got to stop coming around here and making a mess. I don't know why you think you can do that. Kaku looked sheepishly at the ground, and as I spoke, every so often his eyes would drift upward, only to dart back down to his enormous feet. Al Kaku was a mighty man feared by all in the land. His mother was a rock goddess, and his father was the wind. He was sent to provide justice to all the people, and he came to earth on a broken star that plunged down into an empty desert. Three days later, Al Kaku arrived in the place nestled between the majestic and the magnificent cities of Uruk and Ur. He intended to dwell there, and it was there he did dwell. For reasons I shall never know, he had taken a strange liking to me. He yearned for my approval, and it didn't take long after we first became acquainted that there was a heavy price to pay for withholding the love. 
and since I've known him there have been several ugly incidents that my memory declines to access. I'd like to know how you paid for that papaya, I asked him motioning to the trash where I disposed of the stinky fruit. I ordered it under your name, on account. Naturally. And what did you do for a tip, I asked. I gave the guy one of your Vic Teatros. You what, I exclaimed. Why did you do that? It was a set. Sorry, he said as though it was really no big deal. The gigantic cuckoo went for the fridge and I didn't even try to stop him. What was the point? He proceeded to mix himself a cocktail of condiments and when he downed the gooey mixture, my stomach started to turn. At almost eight feet tall and 400 pounds, the mighty al Kaku required constant feeding. And I remember once when he insisted I accompany him on a very long journey, how much he ate each day, which was exactly the nuts of 33 date trees. I want to talk to you, Kaku said with mustard dripping down his chiseled face. You must join me in a mission of both bravery and strength. When I asked him to explain himself, he went on to tell a really wild story about the great Gilgamesh and his best friend Ankadu. In a nutshell, he said they were both cheaters and the tablets were all lies. He said somehow some miscreant slipped in among the scribes and changed the story before the tablets dried. He then implored me to join him in his journey to the land of cedars where he would take down the largest tree and return to his people with his trophy in hand as testament to his greatness. The task, he told me, was not an easy one. The journey would be a long one through the harshest desert terrain, and when we made it, we'd undoubtedly have to challenge Humbaba, the guardian of the forest, who would not suffer the loss of any tree, short of a fight to the death. I was always up for an adventure, but this was different. I had never considered entering the land of cedars before today, and as for Humbaba, I had no intentions of tangling with a monster so great. The fact was, in the civilized world, there was never any question of Gilgamesh and all his awesome deeds. So when al Kaku let his accusations fly, I was a little more than surprised. He said he wanted to set the record straight. I knew he'd only dog me till I agreed. So I decided to put all that aside. And after I put on my favorite walking shoes, we set out on our journey to the land of Cedars. <laughs>